Well, as I said, we're looking together at Luke chapter 19, verses 29 to 48. And I want to look at these verses under the title, When Jesus Comes in Power. When Jesus Comes in Power. The dinosaur, uh, Patagotitan Majorum, um, it's just a bit of a mouth, so I'm going to now call him Bill, is the largest land animal ever known. And he arrived, uh, I'm not sure of the gender, but uh, he arrived, I've called him Bill now, so I'm committed. He arrived at the Natural History Museum from Argentina on Friday. Bill is more than 37 meters long, the size of nine fire engines, and when alive, he would have weighed 50 tons. Um, apparently, um, they were not very maternal as dinosaurs. Their parenting approach consisted of laying a couple of eggs and then just leaving them to hatch and take their chance in the world with no further attention given. This is an innovative approach to parenting which merits serious consideration. <laughs> Bill, Bill has been welcomed into London with huge media coverage. And apparently you approach the skeleton of this beast in the Natural History Museum through a set of monochrome animations, special music, the sounds of a prehistoric forest, even kind of rambling, rumbling footsteps. Um, and then when you confront it, apparently, this huge dinosaur, biggest uh, dinosaur ever, raises some surprisingly deep spiritual questions. One journalist said this, had it been designed by someone, for all its outsized impressiveness, it could be shrugged off as an almighty frippery. But it was engineered by nature, and you could spend ages walking around it and wondering how. Well, Christians believe that these animals were engineered by someone. There is also the immediate issue of authenticity. Uh, there's no complete skeleton of this creature, so a resin replica is all that we have. So what you will encounter in the National History Museum is not the real thing. The real thing died 100 million years ago and will never live again. So today I want to talk from Scripture about the dramatic arrival of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem just 2,000 years ago. And he came to Jerusalem as a living Messiah and Savior. And I want to present him to you from God's Word as a Savior who lives and who reigns forever with an important message for the people of Israel then, for the church of today now, and for you and me for the future. The first point I want to make about Jesus is that despite his humble arrival, there is rejoicing in his presence, rejoicing in his presence. Verse 28, Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. I want to draw out a number of aspects of Jesus' arrival, um, which cause all this rejoicing. First of all, we see Jesus' incredible sovereign power. What I find really significant about the taking of that baby donkey is that not just that Jesus knew it was there and controlled the response of the owners, but that Jesus has the right to take away anything and still to be honored as Savior and Lord. Be aware of the dangers of fair weather Christianity, where we rejoice in God's presence when the sun is shining and we're getting what we want in life. But when God takes something away, be it personal or even material, we walk away with great bitterness. He has the right to take away anything within his plan. Within his plan. He doesn't just take that cult to upset the owner or even its mother donkey and show them who's boss. He's got a plan. And if he has a place for a baby donkey within his plan, he has a plan, a place in his plan for you. Quite significantly, we're told this donkey in verse 30 had never been ridden before. 
I was told on Wednesday this week by someone whose father used to breed donkeys that baby donkeys are a nightmare. They are unmanageable until they're broken in and they kick and they jump and they throw anyone who tries to ride on them. They just chuck them off into the ground. So the suggestion in verse 35 is that they set him on it. That suggests the disciples had quite a job getting the animal under control. It would have been quite funny to watch. There's no mention here of a bridle or even a saddle. They place their cloaks on the animal. And then Jesus takes his seat. And Jesus takes control. There's no greater demonstration of his power than this unmanageable animal The answer to no human being immediately submitting to his will. This donkey will now walk the route that Jesus chooses. Are you one of these people who naturally rebels against anyone telling you what to do? I think I am. And that means we're kind of similar. Allow Jesus to take his place. Walk the road that he chooses. Allow him to be glorified. And be part of his plan. If there's a place in his plan for that donkey, there's a place in his plan for you. Jesus' arrival is also the fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah the prophet wrote around about 520 BC, about 500 years before Christ. In Zechariah 9 verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, Daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. In other words, the Jews were promised that their Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, bearing in mind that the traditional Jewish faith still does not recognize Jesus as Messiah, this issue of how leaders enter Jerusalem has been an issue of huge sensitivity to Jews down through the ages. The German leader, Kaiser Wilhelm II, made a flamboyant entrance on horseback in 1898, causing great offense to the Jews, later going on to start and lose uh, the First World War, dying in exile in the Netherlands, where every year a small dedicated group of German monarchists gather on the anniversary of his death to mourn their last emperor. Also in the First World War, on the morning of the 11th of December 1917, after just one day's fighting, British troops took control of Jerusalem, ending 400 years of Turkish rule. Offered the keys of the holy city by officials, the British general Edmund Allenby dismounted and walked into Jerusalem on foot as a mark of respect to the holy city. And this statement was read out in six languages. Since your city is regarded with affection by the adherents of three of the great religions of mankind, and its soil has been consecrated by the prayers and pilgrimages of multitudes of devout people, I make it known to you that every sacred building, monument, holy spot, shrine, traditional site, endowment, pious bequest, or customary place of prayer will be maintained and protected according to the existing customs and beliefs of those to whose faith they are sacred. And church bells tolled in Roman London to celebrate the peaceful British arrival in Jerusalem and the preservation of the holy city that had been destroyed before 17 times. But Jesus, Messiah, and ruler of all, had already entered Jerusalem 2,000 years before. And here's this brief moment where he is recognized publicly, but note quite specifically, only by disciples. A crowd of them, but by disciples as Messiah and Lord. Verse 37, when Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And Jesus' disciples still rejoice in his presence as we have done today. And has it been amazing to lift our praises in our hearts to God and give him our full adoration. Secondly, when Jesus comes in power, there is weeping over sin and its consequences. As Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives, he sees an amazing sight. From the descent of the Mount of Olives, there's a turn in the road. And as you come around the bend, there is the magnificent view of Jerusalem, the whole city, displayed to your sight. And if you come down in the evening with the sun setting behind the city, you see the lamps going on across the city. 
But Jesus sees more than just the view. He sees the future. He sees your future. He sees my future. He sees eternity. What does he see when he does that? Well, here he prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70. The destruction which Jesus foretold was so great that a plow was drawn by a horse through the middle of Jerusalem. The historian Josephus commented that the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman emperor was so complete that a casual visitor could pass by without even realizing that once a great city had stood there. Indeed, it was said that the Tower of David had been left standing by the Romans only to show passers-by the great heights from which the city had fallen. The citizens, the citizens of Jerusalem decided to reject the kingdom of God and try instead to establish the kingdom of man through political and military intrigue. And the result would be a siege in which Rome would send 80,000 troops, more than the entire British army, to surround the city. The siege began at Passover on the 14th of April, AD 70. Jewish pilgrims were allowed to enter the city, but they were not permitted to leave. So the city became a trap with a shortage of food and water exacerbated by the thousands of pilgrims that had entered but could not leave. And when the city was overrun in August that year, it was totally destroyed with only the western, tower, western wall and the Tower of David remaining. Jesus' description here prophesies that siege in extraordinary detail years before it happened, including the special siege wall, which unusually would, was built around the city to prevent anyone leaving. And here is how he describes it in his prophetic words, verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace... But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Why does Jesus weep over sin and its consequences? He weeps over sin and its consequences because sin is a trap. Sin is a city which is easy to enter but impossible to leave without God's help. And that's why we need a savior. And that is why Jesus weeps over unrighteousness and weeps over Jerusalem. Thirdly, when Jesus comes in power, he cleanses from all unrighteousness. Verse 45, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. Quote, it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Jesus' emptying of the temple was the ending of a racket. By law, God-fearing God Jews were required to offer animals for sacrifice which were without spot or blemish. Um, and the temple inspectors had the power to reject animals from outside the temple on the grounds that they were flawed. So it was safer to buy, for example, a pair of pigeons from one of the official stalls within the temple. The problem was that the inside purchase price was more than 15 times the outside purchase price. So people were being robbed in God's name. You can kind of imagine the scenario. Someone says to the religious authorities, if someone wants to bring their own pigeons for sacrifice in the traditional way, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But what about those who've traveled a long way or whose temple-ready pigeons have not arrived by Amazon? Or perhaps whose Amazon deliveries have not arrived by pigeon. I'm not sure what the right way round is there. Surely it would be nice. Surely it would be nice to have both ways of worshipping God. And after years of talking about it, they gave in. But the leaders of the synagogue were meant to protect the flock. They were meant to protect the world from invading the church. 
and in the nicest, most positive way imaginable, they were meant to help the church invade the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. But they failed. No wonder Jesus had to cleanse the temple. The temple had to be cleansed because such sin could not coexist with the presence of God. But let us not rush to judge others. Let us examine our own hearts. I had an extraordinary dream this week, um, so vivid it stayed with me since, even though I was uncertain of its precise application. It was Tuesday night, and I dreamt in my dream that I was entering the ancient city of Jerusalem and visiting part of the city that I'd never visited before and about to cross a busy road, which I needed to cross to enter one of its gates. And I heard the question in my head, what does Jesus mean to you? What does Jesus mean to you? And I answered one word, everything, everything. And then I wept. And I know it felt, it felt incredibly real because my biggest concern as a slightly socially constricted Brit was to hide the fact that I was weeping from the people I was with while crossing the road safely. It was one of the most vivid dreams I've had for years. And in that dream, I was on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Jesus needs to be everything. And that means the cleansing of things which grieve him. So as I conclude, when Jesus comes in, the power, in power, in the power of his Holy Spirit, there is rejoicing in his presence. And in our worship today, we have seen a foretaste of that greater worship to come in eternity. There is also weeping at sin and its consequences. Allow him to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and join Jesus uh, looking at Jerusalem with compassion as the sun sets on one earthly kingdom and rises on another kingdom which lasts forever. There is rejoicing, there is weeping, and there is cleansing when Jesus comes in power.